Hey guys, this is a video about increasing and decreasing functions and the first derivative test. So the way that these videos work, you want to pause and try the examples when prompted, and there are always free guided notes available at divideandconquermath.com. And if you just want to do me a solid and maybe like my video or subscribe to my channel or share my channel with your friends or leave me a comment, just any sort of feedback to help me keep uh, my free math channel and to kind of grow it a little bit, I would super appreciate it. Okay, so let's get started. So first and foremost, I have two lines here just to remind you of something very basic from algebra. So this line here, is it a positive or is it a negative slope? It is positively sloped. So does that mean that this function is increasing or decreasing? Well, it means it's increasing. And on the flip side, what about this one? So is this a positive or negative slope? Well, by process of elimination, it's a negative slope. Therefore, it's decreasing. So you have this directional sense of how these functions kind of work. So if I were to now make this look a little bit more complicated, we, we still probably have kind of the intuition behind this. So for instance, I have this function here. So as I go from this point to this point, what is happening here? This, this is no longer a slope, right? Because slopes are something that only exists with lines. But is this function increasing or decreasing? Well, it's increasing. And then what about from here to here? What's happening now? Well, now it's decreasing. And then it goes back to increasing. So you already have the intuition for this. And so now what we need to do is we really need to formalize this intuition and back it up with some calculus. So what I want to start with is showing you a corollary that was kind of going to like launch this lesson forward. So this is a consequence of the mean value theorem. So suppose f prime is continuous on the closed interval from a to b and differentiable on the interior. So there are two parts to this. The first part says, if f prime of x is greater than zero for each x in that interval, then f prime is increasing. And if f prime is less than zero for each x in the interval, then f prime is decreasing on that interval. Okay, so what I want you to do is write this down, and I really want you to think about in the simplest terms possible, can you describe what these things mean? Maybe take a moment to pause the video and just see if you can describe this on your own. Okay, so this is basically justifying what we were just talking about from the previous slide. So here, what I know is that the derivative would be increase. The, 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 so this is increasing, so the derivative is positive. So with this corollary, that's what this first part is talking about. If it's greater than zero, so if it's positive, then it's increasing. So all of my derivatives, at all of my points, if I were to plug in the points, this would always be something positive. And then when I get here, this would be a negative derivative. And then for all these points here, these would all be positive again. That is what this corollary is trying to get at. So there's another word that we use for this. It's called monotonic. So we say a function is monotonic if the function is increasing or decreasing on some interval. So you should definitely also have this written down just so that you kind of remember it. Sometimes uh, we use the word monotonic instead of increasing or decreasing. Okay, so before we get into more of what to do with this lesson, uh, what is a critical point and how do you find critical points? At this point, you should know what this is, but if you don't, I just want to take a second to review it. So a critical point is a point C where our function f prime of x or our derivative, where the derivative is zero or undefined. So obviously you have to have some function to kind of build this off of, but this is this is the idea. So this is what critical points are. They are either where the function where the derivative is zero or undefined. And so how do you find critical points? Well, you just have to find the derivative and then either determine where does it equal zero or where is it undefined. So all of this is kind of con contained in this definition. So we're gonna be looking for critical points today. So that's why I just wanted to re refresh your memory on that. Okay, so now that we've got all of this, now what I wanna do is tell you about the, the first derivative, the first derivative test for local extrema. Okay, so this is a little bit long, so I, I have this um, just in two parts. So first, let's just talk about criteria. So let f of x be a continuous differentiable function at every point in some interval, except possibly at a critical point c. So you have to have this, this function f of x has to be continuous, has to be differentiable, and it should be differentiable everywhere except for 
maybe our critical points. So that's going to be that's going to be okay. And you'll kind of see why why this criteria makes sense as as we talk through other videos. But for now, we'll just kind of leave it at that. So here's what the the first derivative test says. First part. If f prime of x changes from positive to negative at that point c, at the critical point, then f of x has a local maximum at c. Here's a little illustration. I will talk about this more in a moment. If f prime of x changes from negative to positive at c, then f of x has a local minimum at c. So here's a little illustration of that. And if the signs do not change, then there is no local extrema at c. Okay, so just focusing on this first part. So I drew this little illustration here. Let me make this a little more clear. Okay, so this is what this is trying to talk about. I am increasing, and then here's kind of the, the peak point. So here's my maximum. So notice what's actually happening here. I go increasing up to this point, and then it's like everything changes, and I go to decreasing. That's what this is talking about. If you go, if your sign changes from positive to negative for the derivative, then there's a local maximum there. And the same thing works if you have a minimum. So if I go from negative to positive at C, then I have a local minimum. So here I would have a negative derivative and then here I'd have a positive one. And you can see here's where my minimum would be or just about here, right? So all of this checks out. So this is what the first derivative test is trying to get at. So sometimes people like to draw little pictures like I've done here just to illustrate that. So if you find that helpful just to kind of make sense of what this all means, go for it. And it's also possible, of course, that you could have the signs do not change, so there's no actual local extrema. It's totally possible that you have a critical point that is not a maximum or minimum. That's why we state this here. So now let's jump into some examples. So there's going to be three things that I want to do. Um, to start, I want to identify the critical points, and then I want to identify the, the intervals of increasing and decreasing. And then I want to identify any local or global maximum or minimum values if I can. So here's my first example. And you see that this is actually f prime of x. So with this first set of examples, I'm just going to show you how to do this when you already know the derivative. Now to remind you of the directions. First things first, we need to identify the critical points. So we find the critical points actually by figuring out where the derivative is undefined or zero. So that's what we have to do here. So in this case, there are no points where this is undefined. This is a polynomial, so it's the domain is all real numbers. You want to think about the domain as you're kind of thinking about this question. So I just have to figure out where does this actually equal zero. So let me set the whole thing equal to zero. And this we can easily solve because it's already factored. Okay, so there are my three places where this equals zero. All right, so now let's talk about the next point. Now we have to identify intervals of increasing or decreasing. So this is where um, we're going to actually set up a table. And let me show you kind of the construction of this. So we're going to have three intervals where we need to figure out the sign of f prime. And then from there, we can kind of make our conclusion. OK, so this is going to be what you generally want to construct based off of you know your, your critical points. And the idea behind this is that your critical points are actually dividing your domain up into intervals. So just to show you that visual representation of this, so in this example here, this maximum, before we knew it was a maximum, we would have found this point as a critical point. And notice what happens here. Up until this critical point, this was increasing, and then the function changed to decreasing. So in general, with functions, if you're going to have this change from increasing to decreasing, that is what's going to happen at critical points. It won't always happen, but that's kind of the idea. So what happens is, these critical points are actually going to divide up our domain into pieces. So we're going to go in, in chronological order here. Now, if you just want a quick visual of kind of how this is going to look, so here's a number line maybe to help me. So my critical points go negative 2, 1, and 3. 
So here's how I would actually divide up my domain. So I'm gonna write these intervals out up here. So starting with this first part, so from here to here, this goes from negative infinity to negative two. Okay, so there's my first interval. Now my next interval, maybe I'll do that in this orange color. So now I go from here to here. This goes from negative two to one. Okay, there's my next interval, and looks like I need a little bit more space. And then for my next one, so I go from here to here, so now I'm going from one to three, and then last but not least, this last part, from here to here, this is going from three to infinity. So you don't have to draw a number line to do this, but if you're struggling to figure out where your intervals are, the number line can be a really effective way to kind of figure that out. So here is kind of how our domain divides up. And so notice then the critical point is kind of representing each cutoff. Okay, so now let's take a look at the next part of this. So now we have to figure out what is the sign of f prime in each interval. And you have some options of how to do this. So in this interval, I have to really figure out a, a test point in here. So any point that is solidly in this interval will do. So what if I chose something like x equals negative 3? x equals negative 3 is definitely in there. So the idea behind this is, and going back to the visual one more time, so remember, if I'm, if I'm looking at this, all, any point kind of on this side of the critical point is going to have this same either positive or negative behavior. So if I chose any point in this example and plug that point into the derivative, it would always be positive. So the idea here is I just have to choose one point and see what the behavior is like in f prime. So I'm going to go ahead and just plug this in. And so you really just want to figure out what is the sign of this. There are two ways that you could do this. So you could actually just multiply this all out and you would find that this is negative 24. The other way you can do this, if you don't want to multiply it out, you can just try to figure out the signs in some cases. So for instance, this would be something negative, this would be something negative, and this would be something negative. So you're multiplying three negative things together to get something negative. All you really care about is figuring out what is the sign of f prime. So if you can kind of just figure that out by looking at the equation, it's, it's okay to do that um, unless you really want to be like a completionist and figure it out all the way, then you, you can figure out the number. So sometimes it just takes a long time to figure these out. So I just wanted to point that out. So all I care about is noting what is the sign of f prime. I'm just going to put that this is negative. And so what does that mean then? This interval, this is an, an interval of decreasing. So let's clear some space and do it again. Moving on to the next interval, what would be the best test point in this interval? It would be zero. So if I analyze what is f prime of zero, so notice I get negative one times two times negative three. So this will be something positive. This ends up becoming really positive six. The number doesn't even really matter. I just have to know that it's positive. So this is gonna be increasing. Okay, so maybe you wanna pause the video here and just see if you can finish the other two intervals. Hit play when you're ready. Okay, so moving on to my next interval, so a test point that's in here. You don't wanna choose the endpoints. It's always gotta be something that's solidly in the point. So in this case, I'm gonna choose x equals two. So I've got f prime of two, if I plug that in, I get something negative. And so again, that's gonna be decreasing. I'm running out of space here, so I'll just write DEC if that's okay. And let me clear this out. And now I can choose just one more point in this last interval, so I'll just choose x equals four. And now I have to figure out this sign. So I ultimately get that this is something positive. I can write increasing here. Okay, so this is the step two, finding our intervals of increasing or decreasing. So let's just summarize that. So let me clear some space. And now I can summarize these intervals. So you probably want to take the time just to make it really clear that you understand where this function is increasing and decreasing. You don't want to just have the table. You want to consider your calculus class always is this is something that's kind of preparing you for real world. And so you wouldn't show your boss this whole table. You would just tell your boss kind of the, the conclusion. So that's it's really just practice for that. Okay, so this was step two. So 
I'm actually going to erase this part here now that we've, we know this and we're going to move on to part three, which part three is identify any local or global max or min values. So let me make some room. So you can answer that question now by just looking at your table and you can see exactly what the first derivative was kind of trying to get at. So remember, if you go from positive to negative, then you have a maximum. And if you go from negative to positive, then you have a minimum. So in looking at this, so I'm going from decreasing to increasing. So decreasing to increasing. So what that tells me is that I have a local min here. Now going from increasing to decreasing, so this is going to look something like this, right? So here at this point I have a local max and then once again I go from decreasing to increasing. So here at this point I have a local min. All right, so you, you can kind of label your table like this just to kind of organize yourself. And then in looking at this, you kind of decide, do you have actually enough information to decide kind of if any of these are a global max or not? Now, if you think about how this function is actually behaving, so you kind of have to think about how the function is behaving to figure that out. So if I just draw a really basic sketch of this, I go from, I start decreasing, then increasing, then decreasing, then increasing. Here is a sketch of kind of what that would pan out to be. So it looks something like this. So you can't really definitively say if any of these are going to be a, which one's a local min or which one's a local max. The problem is that to figure out which one of these would be the, the smallest, which one would actually be the minimum, we would need to know what F prime is. So we don't have enough information to figure this out. And then just even though this is a local max here, you can see from just the, the nature of kind of how this graph is drawn, this will not be the global max. So the idea of something being a global maximum or minimum, that is very much dependent on the context of your function. And in this case, we don't have it. So I'm just going to summarize where my local mins and maxes are. Now, I can't actually tell you what the maximum or minimum is because, again, I need to have the original function, which we just don't have here. So this is as good as I can get. I can just tell you where these occur, but I can't really go any farther than that on this information. So this is the general idea behind this lesson, but this video is already getting to be kind of long. So I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll stop the video here and I will have another video now with just more examples of this idea. So I highly recommend that you watch the next video in this series and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.